facts is the fact that we also identified and found a loss of swimming ability to sublethal exposures uh, of this bloom. So we would expose the, the Eleuthera embryos to the high concentrations for short duration so that it doesn't kill them. And we found that they lost swimming ability, but once they were transferred to a pad-free container, after a few hours, they were able to regain their swimming ability. So again, that's a sublethal type of effect because uh, at least in our minds, right, if a fish can't swim, it's ecologically dead because something probably will eat it if it's just floating uh, in the plane. But that was the first evidence of a sublethal effect. This is building on it to try to see if there's uh, some other behavioral types of, of effects. The first real evidence of avoidance of these blooms in an ecosystem has been found actually in the York River and I say evidence loosely because what they ended up doing was using their fishery survey and a plankton survey found a interesting uh, relationship between catch per unit effort of fish species and when there's high catch per unit effort there were very low concentrations of this had species when there was high, high concentrations Okay, we found you know, the fish were not there. And this was a study that was done with pound nets okay, in New York River. And in Shinnecock Bay, where uh, this bloom has plagued for the last 10 years, there are similar uh, pound net fishermen. And the question is, well, when these blooms come at the end of the summer, is it changing the fish distribution? And obviously, the fishermen are telling us that it does. But uh, it would be interesting to see how these halves could potentially affect fish distributions, and obviously that would have uh, important uh, management implications, right? Because now your fish stocks are staying away from a certain area. Okay, so what I did was essentially use three species of foreign fish, the Atlantic silver side, the inland silver side, and the sheep's head minnow, all approximately the same length, and I created this little videotape arena using two recycled uh, five gallon buckets. I cut the bottoms off, I put a clear plexiglass uh, sandwich in between and white, uh, a white uh, stage underneath. I had a video camera set up here and that essentially videotaped these fish using an HD camera. So what was I actually looking for? Using lowly track 4 software, which was developed in Denmark, essentially I was taking 20 minute video and longer videos, three hours uh, in some cases, exposing fish to sublethal concentrations of this half and seeing how their behavior changed. And again, this is all sublethal concentrations with the idea being we know that it kills them if it's high enough concentrations, but does their behavior change when? Uh, they're exposed to sublethal concentrations. So this software calculates a speed, an acceleration, a time active, and a distance traveled for each of the fish. And I use three fish in each of the uh, containers, and this is consistent uh, with other work that from Dave Conover and Steve Munch at Stony Brook showing that with these silver sides, because they're schooling fish, three is the limit uh, that you can have without them getting stressed out that they're not in school. So it was important that there were multiple fish. And for statistical analysis, uh, I'll explain a little bit more of the experimental design, but essentially just a one-way ANOVA with a Bonferroni uh, multiple comparisons. So the way these experiments work was that to account for inter-individual uh, or individual variability, I had a control trial for each of the treatments paired with uh, another trial. So let me walk you through this. First, I placed the fish in this arena. They acclimated for about 30 minutes, which is uh, consistent with what other literature suggested. I added culture medium, which was our control, which is what these halves grow on in the lab. I recorded it for 20 minutes using the HD camera. I then removed the culture medium and I either added, again, culture medium or the harmful algal bloom species or any possible
positive or negative control uh, that I was interested in. So essentially, this type of approach allows you to account for using the pipette for the fish, uh, taking, out, uh, taking out the volume of water, uh, and it basically allows you to compare from this treatment to that with taking, taking into account the inter-individual variability, which means that your statistical tests are more, uh, are more rigorous and actually are able to tell you something better. They have more power. So again, I have 20 minute recording. I lopped off the first five minutes and the last five minutes, so only 10 minutes uh, was actually analyzed. And this was because uh, after you stick a pipette in there and take out water, uh, you know, I wanted to give the fish some time to you know, relax and sort of swim around normally. Five minutes was a good uh, time to be assessed. So again, we're comparing the difference between this, the, the variables uh, at this stage versus this stage, and that takes into account the inter-individual variability. All right, so our first trial was with uh, Atlantic silversides, and you can see that the change in the mean speed of the fish uh, after these trials, this is going from uh, culture uh, control to culture control, they, their average speed was about the same. When they were added to a, or when they had a sublethal concentration of uh, calcodinium polypicoides added to it, their speed increased okay, about, about 1, 1.5 centimeters per second. So these things were moving faster. And this was statistically significant. And at survival at hour 24, the ones that were exposed to coccolinium died, um, more than 50% of them died at uh, 24 hours, because I wanted to make sure that this experimental procedure didn't kill all my fish in 24 hours that were in the control. Again, to show that you know, there was no undue stress from these arena on the control fish, which is important. So this is, this is interesting, but there is something that it doesn't account for, right? And that's, it doesn't account for the fact that the difference between these treatments could also be because there's something physically floating in the water, these algae. So to account for that, you need a positive control in which we use a different form of uh, dimethylagylate that's about the same size, but it's demonstrated to be non-toxic. So we use similar concentrations of this non-toxic algal bloom species and this uh, coccodinium polypicoides species. And what we found is that there was a significant difference between both the positive control and the, uh, sorry, between the coccodinium polypicoides and the controls. This negative control here is seawater. We wanted to make sure that our culture medium, which is essentially seawater modified with nutrients and all the things that takes to grow this algal culture. So to account for it, we had a negative control, which was seawater, to make sure that it was, uh, you know, that we had similar behavior during seawater. Coclodinium and the positive control were different, and the positive control, even though it seems larger, was not significantly different than the other controls. So again, the only one that significantly increased the speed of the fish was this harmful algal bloom species, the one that's toxic to fish. Using a different, and there was high survival in all of these, so this is again a behavioral effect uh, where they're surviving, but maybe it's affecting their behavior somehow. Okay, we used another species which, from acute toxicity experiments, has been shown to be much more robust, and this is the sheep's head minnow. And these things are kind of like paints. Uh, maybe they're like goldfish, they're very hardy. Uh, and we did a trial with them, and there was essentially, I haven't run the statistics because there's still four more videos, but pretty sure that there won't be any differences uh, between the positive controls, the coccodinium polypicoides, and the culture medium. And this is uh, consistent with other studies that maybe these fish actually 
you know, don't, uh, aren't affected by or maybe they can't protect this have species. So I want to mention that the ends here represent the amount of trials and for each of these experiments, even though they, you know, doing this experiment will take about seven hours during the day, consistently changing it, it takes a little over a month to process all these videos. So uh, it's an important consideration and, uh, you know, my aim was really trying to see if you can do something like this and if it's feasible uh, you know, in the time frame to actually get uh, enough power to say anything. So there was high survival at, uh, at this, uh, with this species also. So here I have two videos just to give you a little bit of an idea of what this kind of array looks like. So over here, uh, Jeff is just going to play the control. Did I click it? OK. So what you're going to see is you're going to see those little dots are the fish, and they're numbered one through three. And that green line, if anybody's familiar with hockey, they tried to implement this type of technology. It's the one second delay. So it gives you a better idea of you know, how the fish are moving. So you can see fish number one, fish number two, fish number three. And this is a control trial, so they're getting the same culture medium that they were able to survive in, and that's all well and good. Okay, so. Uh, Jeff, would you mind playing that again and then playing this one uh, alongside just so we can see a comparison? Okay. So, this is when they're exposed to sublethal concentrations. So, I don't need to tell you, you know, that the stats were statistically significant, but you can see that there's obviously some kind of uh, behavior going on where these fish, you know, are increasing their speed. They're increasing their total distance that they're moving. Uh, they're obviously not happy to be in there. Now, this brings up a lot of questions. Well, do fish, are fish able to detect this? Or is this they are getting some kind of toxicity that's making them uncomfortable, that's making them move more? So, again, I told you that this software calculates other things. There was no changes in acceleration of the fish. The time active, they were more active when they were exposed to this harmful algae. Uh, the total distance swam, they swam further distances. Uh, and though all of those things ultimately are, you know, at least in my interpretation, are signs that these fish obviously don't want to be there. Okay, they're increasing their velocity, they're increasing their speed, their distance that they're traveling. Uh, so, so the take home message is that this could be a important laboratory method to uh, do other sorts of behavioral experiments with these species we know it works well with. The results demonstrate that exposure to sublethal concentrations of C. polypicoides uh, elicits some kind of behavioral effect, okay, particularly for the velocity. And further research is needed to explore the effects of have concentration and increased exposure times to this avoidance or uh, behavior experiment. Again, I told you if these were the 10 minute videos and it took about a month, imagine what the three hour videos would take to process. Uh, you know, essentially my computer's been running since October, constantly crunching these numbers. And ultimately, right, what we want to do is try to validate this in the field, because if you have those large blooms that cover an area of a bay, are the fish going to be able to uh, detect this bloom and swim the other way? Or if they can't detect it, are they going to find themselves in a, the middle of a bloom patch and ultimately die? So there's a lot of interesting questions uh, that can continue in this, particularly with the avoidance uh, issue of can fish avoid these blooms? Uh, can they detect them? So with that, I'd like to thank my funders, the Shinnecock Bay Restoration Program, members of my lab, and uh, I'd like to also thank you all for listening. And here's a photo of the Baconic Bay. You can see this sort of rusty color here, and then it's sort of bluer there. So these blooms are, you know, it could be a big management uh, problem. So thank you. I'll take any questions. If